This is Bandit Atari 8-Bit Podcast. True story. When we did conflict, we had no documentation. So we literally started poking addresses to find out how to do things. Literally. And, you know, it sounded like a good deal, but I was still in grad school. So I said, well, I would only do that if you paid me X. Where X, for the time, was some ridiculous amount of money. And they said, sure, we'll pay you that much. It looked, it looked, ter- it looked like annoying as hell, but it was funny. Because it made you think like you were in a radar room, you know? Well, Voyager 1 was inspired by Alien. In fact, I remember taking my future wife to the premiere of Alien in Philadelphia, thinking that it was going to be like uh, Star Wars, pretty lighthearted and all that, and was kind of shocked. As was she. Our first movie date. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. William Volk wrote three Atari games for Avalon Hill, Conflict 2500, Voyager 1, and Controller. He also wrote Fourth Turtle Graphics Plus, a 3D graphics library for the fourth language that was released by Atari Program Exchange, and Val Graphics for Valpar International, and Super Smart Terminal, an 80-column terminal application which may have been released by APX. He later went on to work on Return to Zork for Activision. This interview was conducted March 25th, 2015. Am I noisy or is it okay? It's you're definitely like in a restaurant, but uh, yeah, I will be po- I'll be muting it when I'm not talking. Okay, no, you'll be talking a lot, so uh... <laughs> it'll work out okay. Yeah, it'll be fine. Sure. I interviewed one guy when he was in the hospital getting his kidney dialysis done. Oh, so, that's uh, Trees. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> no, um, no, I, um, I, I work in uh, a different town, and I ride my bike here, and then I uh, grab breakfast, and I get to work and all that. Um, I don't know you know what I do, but I'm the uh, chief creative officer of a uh, mobile game company called PlayScreen. Okay. Awesome. So you, yep. you've been in, in uh, the, the game making programming uh, community for a very long time then yeah I, I'm, I'm more of a marketing quant and somewhat of a designer now but I've actually been in the game industry since I started playtesting games in 79 if, if that is unbelievable as that seems wow uh, so it's been a long time tell me what were you what were you playtesting and, and how did you get that gig I was in grad school uh-huh. uh, and I took a job at Avalon Hill they had just started doing computer games for the TRS-80 and the Apple II so I started playtesting their games, and uh, as a as a as a winter break job, and then I um, I basically started writing games for them. Did three games for Avalon Hill. The first of which was Conflict Twenty Five Hundred, which was um, uh, published in nineteen eighty and was their first Atari eight hundred game. Wow. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty cool. How I. Avalon Hill was mostly war simulations, right? They're mostly board games. And so the games okay. I did, like Conflict was a war game. Mm-hmm. And then Voyager 1, which was a really odd game I did in 81, uh, was kind of odd because what it really was was a, um, a fixed perspective uh, wireframe first-person shooter. I mean, it was you could look northeast, south, and west. It had a maze-like construction, and you were basically shooting stuff. You know, and, and, and recharging your weapons and all that crap. It was pretty bizarre for its time. And then I did an air traffic control game called Controller, uh, which uh, was pretty good. Nice. So, all right. So let, tell me more about Avalon Hill. So you're a play tester, and then how, how did you – Oh, they just 6502, said uh, – how did, how did you move up, you know, to – Well, I, I bought myself an Atari 800. I actually own a, a computer called a Ohio Scientific C4P. Mm-hmm which was a uh, 6502-based computer. Um, I bought that before I even got the Atari, and then I got the Atari 800. In fact, I blew $1,200 in $1980 to buy a a fully equipped Atari 800, which is a a lot of money. Invested. Invested. (laughs) Yeah, I made it back right away. I mean, I, I, uh, I did really well with these. You know, for the time, I did really well with these games. At the time... I thought I wasn't doing really well, but what I learned later on is everyone in the industry was sort of overestimating their their dollars to make themselves look good. Mm-hmm. So I actually did pretty well with those games, 
so I did those free games for Avalon Hill and um, actually tested some pretty cool games as well. I, I was a play tester on Chris Crawford's Legionnaire, which is one of the best games Avalon Hill ever did. Mm-hmm. Play tested the adventure game uh, Lords of Karma, which I thought was very good. Um, but uh, the free games I did, um, Voyager 1 is the most uh, advanced. Conflict 2100 is, is most well-known. And Controller, the air traffic control game, was probably the best one in terms of just sheer timing because it hit just about the time the air traffic control strike and, and the Re- the Reagan thing happened. Hmm. And it was a cool game. It was a real-time air traffic control simulation. And mostly what I coded in back then was assembly language subroutines and basic i would do the the, the core of the program the, the the framework of the program would be in basic and then i would write subroutines in assembly language particularly you make machines on the um like the um commodore pet which we basically for voyager we basically had to write uh, our own line drawing routine since the machine didn't have line drawing graphics mm-hmm. it was completely character map system but we found right. a way of using some of the character blocks and coming up with a low res line drawer for the uh for the um commoner pet we did the same thing on the uh trs-80 so it's pretty cool so you did versions for oh, I'm gone. every yeah. platform oh yeah i had and i own the coco as well so i didn't own a trs-80 model one but i did versions for the apple II. well i guess the voyager game was the one that had the most versions. so voyager was apple II. Atari 800-400, TRS-80 Model 1, TRS-80 Coco, um, Commodore Pet, and IBM PC. And later on, I discovered literally about a year or two ago that had been ported to some of the Japanese machines of the era as well. Hmm. And I didn't even know that. So nice. that that's funny. So, so yeah, we, we, we did all those machines ourselves. So were you an employee of Avalon Hill? No, I was a contract. I was just an independent. Okay. So they, were they paid you with, with royalty? or, or Yeah, royalties. Yeah. Did pretty well. Nice. I got I got to fix my um, – brother at the time was in law school. He's now a law professor. And so he uh, did a pretty good job of helping me out with this. And I ended up with a, a deal where I would get a fixed amount of money for every product shipped. And I, I think Avalon Hill was kind of reluctant, but they did it anyway, and it worked out really well. What happened next? You're at Avalon Hill, and then what? Then I took a job. I was I had so when I was doing stuff for the Atari Program Exchange, as well, mm-hmm. and I I had met. Um, I was at University of New Hampshire by then doing graduate work, and one of the professors there introduced me to um, the MIT AI Lab, and I met a guy named Seymour Paparit and other people. And Seymour was doing something called Logo. Do you remember Logo? Sure. Yeah. So. There wasn't a logo on the Atari 800, and I had the Atari 800, and I was just starting the program in FORTH, F-O-R-T-H. Yes. So I just I started writing turtle graphics stuff in FORTH, <laughs> and then I wrote a um, package for the Atari FORTH called FORTH Turtle Graphics Plus, which I put through the Atari Programming Exchange. I did one more program for that. I did something called SST, which I can't find anywhere, which was a terminal emulator that did 80-column text on the uh, Atari 800 by using a really small font. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you you emailed me years ago and said that you didn't see it in in the list. I've gone through all of the the APX catalogs and I don't see it mentioned. So I'm wondering if was it maybe a a really late APX release? Probably a really late release. Hmm. It was something I wrote for myself and just shoved into the catalog. Hmm. And it it did um, it did um, X modem, mm-hmm. it did eighty column stuff. It was it was pretty good. Did it work with like a modem connected through the eight fifty interface? Yeah, modem through the interface on the Atari mm-hmm. eight hundred. And it gave you eighty characters by showing super three small by character. seven font. Okay. You did a three by seven font, a four by seven font. It actually used four by seven pixels, so it gave you an eighty column display in the three twenty by two hundred mode. Okay, so crazy. it used what basic programmers would call graphics eight, I guess. Yeah, to... it just used to have, yeah the the high res the what called the high res black and white mode. Right. Um, and and it, and it worked. I mean, it was, and you could transfer files and all mm-hmm. that. Neat. It was pretty pretty simple. Um, yeah, it, it was um, 
just something I wrote for myself because I was using university computers through my dorm room with that. Mm -hmm. I needed any columns to run the editors. Hmm. Neat. So did uh, how did that sell? Did anybody Very buy little. It? Yeah. I think Atari was sort of folding up by then, you know, the uh, program exchange. Right. It's yes. a shame because didn't Chris Crawford, well, Chris Crawford did Eastern Front. Yes. That was an amazing game. I think that came out through Apex. And people don't remember this. Chris Crawford wrote the definitive programming guide to the Atari computers. Do you remember that? Good. Day Ray Atari, sure. Day Ray Atari, yeah. yeah. And that really cool. opened up. Uh, Atari was really closed-lipped about developer documentation up to that point. And oh, yeah. When, when we did Conflict, mm -hmm. true story, when we did Conflict, we had no documentation. So we literally started poking addresses to find out how to do things. Huh. Literally. There was no documentation when Conflict was done. Wow. We didn't know how to change graphics modes, but we figured it out. Um, it was pretty bizarre. Uh, so, yeah, his book was great. And I was actually getting into doing much higher-end stuff in Forf because Forf was a pretty good compact language. And I was just doing that when I got – what happened was this. I was working on something called Val Graphics, which actually was published by Valpar International. Val Graphics um, was a 2D graphics package for the Atari – 800 that worked with their version of Forf called Val mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this. I know some of this, but you but be, feel free to fill in. Well, the story gets first. even weirder because yeah. I started doing a wireframe 3D system called Val, Val World. And there's a game out there called Universe that has me credited for that. And I didn't even know about that for until decades later. So if you look at – in um. You know, what's that thing that has all the game credits? So I keep forgetting. Um, like a, you know, the, the 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 website that has all the games listed and all the credits for all the games in history. Like a, I, I don't know which one you mean. I, I use Atari uh, Mania. Oh, I'm, I'm almost, a, almost a tip of your tongue. Um, anyway, the point is I'm listed there because they use the uh, Val World 3D graphics to do this game called Universe. Hmm. On the Trends uh, Universe? Moby Games, Moby Games, Moby Games. Okay. Yeah, Moby Games. So... Now, here's the thing. Val Forf, Val Graphics, Val World, they are all for Val Par. has nothing to do with what happened next. What happened next was I heard about a computer coming out called the Epson QX10. Okay. This was a Z80-based machine with a 256K of RAM. It had, like, some sort of banking system, mm -hmm. and it had, it had pretty high-res graphics, and it had a, a graphics coprocessor called an NEC 7220. Mm -hmm. It... Drew vectors in, in hardware. It was pretty fast. So I go to call Epson and try to sell them the, the 3D graphics stuff. I figured it would be a good thing to have for the machine. Mm -hmm. They said you got to talk to these people in Los Angeles. So I ended up working for a company doing something called Valdox, which has nothing to do with Valforf or Valpar. It's just called Valdox. Huh. And for them, I did a product called Valdraw. And I ended up working for them. And this was like the very end of 82 to the very end of 84. Mm -hmm. And it was like my first real salary job. And um, it was a very interesting situation because we built an entire software system for this computer. And it was a very difficult thing to pull off. And uh, I did a, um, a, a really cool drafting package called, um, called Valdraw. Hmm. And then what happened was I fell in love with the Macintosh. Uh, started working on a Mac game called The Pyramid of Peril, left uh, that company called Rising Star, and co-founded a company called Aegis Development, and did um, uh, Pyramid of Peril and Mac Challenger, Space Shuttle Flight Simulator, did another drawing package, did that all the way to um, 88 when I got hired by Activision. Hmm. But hired by Activision to run technology run development in a way, mm -hmm. uh, managed to survive a whole bunch of turmoil, end up doing a, the technical production and engine for a game called The Return to Zork, which is my uh, biggest career success. Hmm. And I was Activision for six years and left as vice president of technology. Nice. Cool. Then I went into um, educational software for five years, which may not have been the smartest thing. <laughs> came close to um, striking it big uh, in terms of like uh, the company went public. It was a big deal. 
mm-hmm. and that was a company called called uh, Light, the Lightspan Partnership or Lightspan, and and we built a hundred games for the uh, Sony PlayStation One, but for schools, games for schools, but for the Sony PlayStation One. For instance, give me some examples. You you can't even know what they are. They're, they're, they never were sold to the public. They were sold to schools as a single package of a hundred discs. Hmm. Stuff like Mars Moose and. Stratus and all that. I mean, mm-hmm. we spent building those titles. Our budget for building those titles was about one hundred twenty million dollars. And then you're expecting money by selling to schools, to school, which have yeah. no money. <laughs> well, at the time it worked because there was this whole program, title something of it, where schools that were disadvantaged were given money to do just this, to find mm-hmm. ways of improving it. Mm-hmm. And that all changed in the two thousand decade. That all went away, and so the company went public in early two thousand. Had a market cap of a a billion dollars, so I can say I helped build a billion-dollar company. Then the markets collapsed. And so what I did at that point is a whole bunch of things, but eventually I found my way into mobile games. And I worked at literally uh, several companies. The the, the one that was most earliest and most interesting was called Bonus Mobile from 2000 – from from 2000 and – trying to think, four to 2005, to two years, 2004, 2005, and we did a mobile game with the Wayans Brothers called The Dozens, which was a card game with Yo Mama insults, and we even had a booth at E3 and everything. It was pretty big. We were way ahead of our time, way, way, way ahead of our time. Mm-hmm. And then I co-founded a company called Binumo. When the iPhone came out, we did the very first games in the browser. And then 2010, my new one was incorporated into a new company <laughs> called PlayScreen. I've been there ever since. I recently co-designed a game called Stick Figure Movie Trivia. Okay. So um, take a look at Stick Figure Movie Trivia when you get a chance. It's quite fun. Awesome. And that's on the iPhone? Yeah, Android? yeah. yeah? All right. hey, iPhone and, and uh, iPad. Um, there may be a universal version coming out afterwards. Yep. Cool. It's just my long and sort of history. There are other things that happened as well. In 89 at Activision, I green-lighted a title and did the CD-ROM work on it, which was the first CD-ROM game from some two guys in Texas at the time called Rand and Robin Miller, and that was Cyan. So I sort of gave Cyan their first start. Nice. I actually, yeah, which was cool. <laughs> Activision actually, don't people don't remember this? Activision almost went out of business in 1990-91. And, uh, but I knew Bobby Kotick, the future chairman of Activision, from the Amiga days mm-hmm. when I was at Aegis. So we got along pretty well, and he kept me along. And because of that, I was able to actually do the, um, the return to Zork. So, yeah, I'm the only uh, senior person to have survived the Bobby takeover of Activision. Nice. Yeah, nice. pretty good. So back to the Atari stuff. I, I would like to know more about the the fourth stuff, but honestly, I know so little about fourth. I don't even know what to ask. So I know fourth is a weird language. Weird. And, yeah. Um, so and so you were did like was it a, like an add on pack to the official Atari fourth yeah, yeah. cartridge? Yeah. Yeah. It was basically this. Fourth is a weird language. In that, what you do is you manipulate numbers on a stack. It's sort of like an HP, an old HP calculator, in the way the math works. Okay. So if you want to add two numbers from a variable, you'd say, you'd say the name of the variable fetch, the name of the other variable fetch. You'd hit use plus to add them together. Then you say another variable, and then you'd say store, you know, which was an exclamation mark, and that would actually add the two values from the variable and then put them back in another variable. Okay. You can go on Wikipedia and look it up, and you'll see some code example. It is very weird. What's good about Forf is that it, it runs closer to assembly language speed than any other language like it, and it's small, really small, because it packs each instruction into a um, 16-bit word. It can, you know, you can have complicated instructions that are basically still only stored as a 16-bit word in the in the stream of instructions. So Forf is a compact language, and it was used by a lot of people at Atari in the arcade division. It turns out mm-hmm. some of the arcade machines were done in Forf. You ever hear something called the Rotberg synthesizer on the Atari? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, you look it up. There's a thing called the Rot R O T B E R G synthesizer. This is a synthesizer written by someone at Atari on the 800 that was just gorgeous music synthesizer, and it was done that way as well. Hmm. Cool. 
So I was looking for something that was between assembly language and let's say Pascal that would basically work on the Atari and allow me to write small code. That's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to do turtle graphics. Turtle graphics is where you have an imaginary turtle on the screen and you say go forward five, turn right 60 degrees, lift pen, put right. pen down. Kind of what, what Logo is known for. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, so yeah, I did a whole library of that. Even did things like where you could set a window. You could say, okay, I want to use this part of the screen for this drawing, and it would actually draw within that window and clip everything into that window. So you could have multiple windows. And what people did is they drew fancy fractal-type stuff with it, and it was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyway, Atari picked it up. And um, eventually, Dalpar International out of Arizona picked up a fancier version of that, and that became Val Graphics. And then I started working on the 3D library. Uh, wire for, I was in grad school, so I was taking classes in computer graphics and 3D and all that. Mm -hmm. So I actually um, was able to um, create wireframe 3D stuff and um, had that as a package as well. Nice. Cool. I intended to do more games after the third one using fancier stuff, but I got swept. What happened literally is when I tried to sell... The graphics package to Epson, and I called the people in Los Angeles. Remember, I was living in Pennsylvania at the time, and said, I've got a 3D package I want to sell for your Epson computer. They said, well, we need someone to run the West Coast group here. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, let me see, how old was I? Um, about 25 at the time, I guess, mm -hmm. or, yeah, 25 or so. And, you know, it sounded like a good deal, but I was still in grad school. So I said, well, I would only do that if you paid me X, where X for the time was some ridiculous amount of money. And they said, sure, we'll pay you that much. <laughs> so I sort of left grad school, took the job, eventually moved to California, and that was what happened. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Do you still have an Atari or any of that stuff? I gave the Atari to a computer museum years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I still run the emulators, though. On my, uh, I have an emulator for my Mac, and I can run uh, the Atari through emulation. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. No, it's good. Controller, as controller is hard to run because controller used vertical blank interrupt tricks. Mm -hmm. um, there was two versions of controller on the disk. One version used just a normal display with a radar sweep going around, mm -hmm. and that was that. But the other version actually tried to make things look like an old Capital Ray tube by actually switching between two graphics modes at vertical blank. So you had a 60 hertz switch between two modes. So the screen literally was blinking at you, showing you the airplanes moving around and the radar map and all that. And, and that was annoying, but... Um, it was a really cool version, so Avalon Hill made me put both versions on the disc. Wow. And yeah. was basically the user could pick which version they... Yeah, they yeah. Were. Huh. I've never heard of anything like that before. It looked, it looked, it looked like annoying as hell, but it was funny. <laughs> it made you think like you were in a radar room, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, what happened there was a guy named Kel Frank Kelly was working at a uh, own the video store in Ports of New Hampshire... He basically is the initiator for the game. He came to me and said, hey, look, uh, he sold Atari 800s. Mm -hmm. So he's an Atari 800 dealer. He said, look, I wrote this little program that does a radar sweep. Isn't that cool? And I go, oh, we should do a game. And he goes, well, I was an air boss in the Navy. I basically managed the uh, traffic for airplanes. Uh -huh. So he knew enough. And we did think, and I had the degree in physics by then. So... We had different types of planes that could climb and descend at different rates. They could turn at different rates. Big planes, small planes. And your job was to get them all down safely, to get them all landing safely. And that meant getting them at a certain altitude, at a certain distance away from the runway. And you had to avoid mid-air collisions and all that. It was a hectic mm -hmm. game. It ran all. It just ran continuously. It wasn't like a turn-based game at all. Right. So uh, Frank gave me the intelligence uh, on how the thing worked, and we did it. And it actually hit Avalon Hill just as the air traffic controller strike hit. Mm -hmm. So 
So that was a good. Fun. That was a good thing, you think? Because people yeah. were had oh, air yeah. traffic on the brain. Look in the news. Yeah. Look at the box art for this. Look up Avalon Hill controller. They did such a great job on the box art. It's one of the best boxes they ever did. It is one of the best pieces of artwork I've oh, ever nice. seen. Nice. That's beautiful. Nice. And we had to do that game for with Avalon Hill. We had to do the game for all those machines, which was hard. Yeah. Because yeah, the Atari had... The Atari... I, I would say the two best machines of the era for different reasons were the Atari 800 because it had all the graphics, you know, the Antic chip and all that. It had all the chips and stuff to do, the fancy graphics modes, and you could... There was a... You know, I, I was just becoming really facile with it because of Day Ray Atari and all that. Mm -hmm. There was so much you could do. And the other machine was that which was very good for the era was the Coco. And the Coco wasn't good because of anything with the graphics coprocessor. It was good because it had a really cool Motorola processor called the 6809. Right, which was a pretty fast processor, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, beautiful processor. I mean, in many ways, the 6809 was in some ways superior to the 68000 in terms of the uh, instruction set. Mm -hmm. In fact, the story is that the original Macintosh... The original, original Macintosh, before Jobs switched over from the uh, Lisa group to run it, was 6809 base. Hmm. I hadn't heard that. I mean, Coco was uh, not as good graphics, but it was uh, very fast. So, yeah, TRS-80 was horrible graphics. The Z80 at 1 megahertz was a very slow chip. Um, not that great. The Apple II... Well, the Apple II is like, you know, it's history, you know. There were so many people working on the Apple II for so long that by the early 80s, anything you wanted to do, there was a, someone had a routine for it. Mm -hmm. But the graphics was primitive. Right. In fact, the funny story behind Conflict. So Conflict was coded originally on an Apple II before I got my 800. So Apple II had a thing called shape tables where you could define a series of drawing instructions and it would just draw it as fast as it could. Mm -hmm. And then so you, could hired, you could rotate and change the size, I believe. Right, and, right, right, right. So I, I, I hired an artist, $500 of my own money in wow. grad school, <laughs> to draw on a sketchbook all these beautiful spaceships. And I started building this version that had the, uh, the, the draw objects uh, on the Apple II of these beautiful spaceships. It looked gorgeous, but it was 48 kilobytes. The program was 48K. Mm -hmm. And Avalon Hill said, nope, it's got to be 16K. There's mm -hmm. too many 16K Apple IIs out there. So I went to low-res graphics on that. But it was pretty cool looking when it was high-res. Nice. Yeah. And that game was inspired by the original Star Trek games. I had been playing... In the 70s, when I was in college, I had access to a Commodore PET, mm -hmm. and I would pay um, the original Star Trek game, you know, with the the map and the and the phasers and the and the photon torpedoes and all sure. that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I liked it so much, so I was in thrall with a TV show, an anime show that was just on TV, known in the United States as, um, uh, well, in Japan it was called Starship Yanomoto. In the United States, it was Star Raiders. Okay. Star Blazers, Star Blazers. And I love Star Blazers, so I basically took the idea of Star Blazers and built a game where you had multiple ships under your command and multiple enemy ships and bases and planets and all this stuff, and that was conflict. Nice. So, yeah. All you right. can still run that. Um, I'll check that out in the emulator. So, okay, we talked about controller. We talked about 2500. Uh, let's talk a little more about Voyager 1. Well, Voyager 1 was inspired by Alien. Um, in fact, I remember taking my future wife to the premiere of Alien in Philadelphia, thinking that it was going to be like uh, Star Wars, pretty lighthearted and all that, and was uh -huh. kind of shocked, um, as was she. Our first movie date. Oh, man. My wife number one. I was married to her for 20 years. But anyway, I love the idea of you're on a ship, there's these marauding things out to get you, and you have two options. I wanted to have two options. One was kill them all. Mm -hmm. Go around and just get them all. Always, the other a, option was, always a popular option. Always popular. <laughs> the other option was why don't you basically set the ship on self-destruct, find a shuttle and get off before it blows up. Hmm. So at the time I was playing with uh, 
what we now call algorithmic terrain generation. Mm -hmm. But it, had a, it wasn't called that back then. I, I had found a way of generating random mazes in an algorithm. And so the way I did Voyager was it was a, 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 a series of floors with a series of rooms. And each room could be a corridor or a room itself with doors. So I generated the entire layout randomly. And you ran around and there were these robots that had taken over the ship. And you could, you could find weapons. You could charge up weapons. You could shoot the robots. And, um, and, but there was also a shuttlecraft. And there were elevators you would get to to change floors. And what you would do is you'd either go around shooting the robots, recharging your weapons... Or, and if you got hurt, you could actually rest and recharge yourself, which was probably a mistake. If I had just come up with the health pack idea, the game would have been so much better. Health pack was a really simple way of solving that problem, but it didn't occur to me to do a health pack. Mm. I just had you rest. So you could either kill the robots or you could destroy the power generators. Once you destroyed the last power generator, the ship went into a self-destruct sequence, and you had a certain amount of time to find the... Um, the shuttle and, and escape before it blew up. Hmm. The game was in wireframe 3D. I don't even know how... If you look at the box, it shows you the TRC-80 graphics, which hmm. I think was a mistake to put on the box, but it was amazing that it even ran on the TRC-80, but it looked really good on the Atari 800. Yeah, I'm looking at the, at the box. I mean, the yeah, all the, the pictures in the back of the box are all crappy TRC-80, but the, the art on the front's great. It looks like a Isaac Asimov novel or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. uh, guys skulking down a corridor shooting robots and... And if you look at the Moby games, I see the graphics for the different versions. Uh -huh. It looks pretty good for the t date. It's just a wireframe 3D game. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Some innovations there were the game was randomly generated. The map on the right only showed you what you had explored. Mm -hmm. So the map would basically update as you look down corridors or open doors, went down elevators. The map would be updated based on what you had seen. It wasn't it wasn't all there to begin with. The map actually showed you what you had explored. Pretty cool. Nice. Um, I would later take the same idea, replicate it in a pyramid, do it with shaded graphics on the Mac, and that was Pyramid Apparel in 1985. Hmm. So I, I revisited the idea there. But Pyramid Apparel... You were an explorer exploring a pyramid, trying to find a certain prize, and battling mythological creatures. Hmm. And in, in Pyramid of Peril, I did have health potions. I had figured that out by then. Mm -hmm. And I had different weapons, and I had scrolls that would give you hints, as well as prizes you could collect that would add to your score until you got to the bottom level. And when you got to the bottom level and retrieved the idol then the game would go berserk and throw every monster it could at you. <laughs> so pretty much the game was almost unfinishable, and people loved that. They loved the fact that it was really difficult. Nice. Cool. So, yeah, Pimber Apparel on the Mac was a, a sort of an update on the Voyager game I had done for the Atari, the Coco, the IBM, the TRS-80, the, uh, the Commodore Pet, and so on and so on. I did all those versions myself, by the way. Wow. The only version I didn't do was the Japanese versions, but I didn't even know that happened until about a year ago. Hmm. Were those official versions, you think? Or, I mean, li license yeah, those are official Avalon Hill versions. Huh. No one ever told me. Probably because they didn't want to uh, give you a cut. Yeah, I probably should um, call Hasbro up and ask for my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah right. That'll, that'll work. <laughs> Plus interest. Yeah. No, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to get the rights to reboot Return to Zork and do that over again because that game was so cool for its day. And, and you know, there are almost 4,000 YouTube videos about Return to Zork on uh, just bitching about the game. Amazing. Really? Wow. Yeah, the, the, the story on that is simple. Av Activision was, we thought Activision was going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. We had an earlier game that was panned as being too easy. Mm -hmm. We had the, the go-ahead to do this Return to Zork game with really good producers and writers and artists. Uh, um, a budget that was very high for its day. Bobby basically thinking we were crazy. 
And so we, we were basically unfettered to do whatever we wanted to in terms of puzzles. So we made the game deliberately unfair. Huh. Return to Zork is deliberately unfair. It does things that don't make sense, and you don't realize you've made mistakes for hours and hours later. And it's part of its charm. It's considered to be uh, one of the most difficult adventure games ever created, and that's why there's almost 4,000 videos on YouTube. Huh. But wow. Activision is a very big company. It's hard to get to anyone there. Sure. But um, I've tried to put the feelers out saying, look, I'll give you a percentage of the revenue. Just cut me a deal, and let's reboot this on Kickstarter. Well, before it was acquired by Activision, I mean, Infocom was sometimes known for doing games that were just, like, stupidly unfair. Right. And they were, un I mean, they were uneven about it. But, I mean, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy comes was to mind. Awesome. Which, one of, yeah, it was a great game. But it was one of those games where you could get to the very end of the game and realize that you didn't take the toothbrush in the first scene and you're, you're screwed, you know? Right. I know Moretsky pretty well. In fact, I was chatting with him at the GDC show a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and he's just a great guy. And, and he did the, the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, and, and he worked with me on the game before Return of Zork, which was Lever Goddess of Phobos 2, which was universally panned. But the whole point of LGPO2 was to build a casual game before there was such a thing as casual game. We decided mm -hmm. we'd build an easy adventure game, mm -hmm. a game where it was really just a, a point-and-click, enjoy the graphics, enjoy the comedy type game. Mm -hmm. And I think only few people liked it. Everyone else hated it because hmm. they said it was over too fast and too simple. But it was really more of an uh, uh, interactive uh, comic uh, than it was a... Um, than it was a uh, game game, and, and it got panned. So when we did Return to Zork, we were like, we actually would name puzzles after reviewers. We <laughs> name a puzzle the such and such memorial puzzle <laughs> in the code, um, and, um, and and that's how it worked. And Return to Zork was just out there. I mean, it, one of the reasons I left Activision is because I dearly, dearly, dearly wanted to continue in that vein, because Return to Zork did a couple things that are not very common. Every scene you were at, you could take a picture of any scene, mm -hmm. and you could ask a character about a picture of anything, and they would have a comment about it. And quite often that was necessary to s figure things out. Hmm. Every conversation was recorded on a tape recorder, and you could ask a character about whatever character had said. You could ask a character about any object you had. You could ask a character about locations on a map. It was crazy. And the objects themselves... You'd interact object to object or object and scene, and it would have like a, a diamond interface that was like a reverse parser and would construct a sentence that was going to occur. So it tried to bring back that Infocom feel with the reverse parser. But in the most cruelest, ironic thing that ever happened is Cyan and Activision had parted ways when Activision went into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And Cyan did a title called Mist with Brodobun, that was a huge success. Sure. That tied the most successful game in history. Mm -hmm. Activision didn't want to continue with the sort of detailed, tricky puzzles of Return to Zork. They wanted to do a game more like Myst, which is ironic since I green-lighted Cyan's first game, The Manhole. Mm -hmm. hmm. But those guys are brilliant. They did some great stuff. Yeah. Myst is a great game. Um yeah, so, yeah, it's a, it all ties back to, I, I did, when I was doing Voyager, what I anticipated was taking this idea of this sort of algorithmically generated layouts, what I used to call randomly generated layouts, and adding much more depth to it, adding, putting it into a forest, so that instead of having just walls and doors, there'd be trees and rocks and streams and canyons and stuff, and it all would be generated in the same algorithmic way that I generated Voyager. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea behind that. Mm -hmm. And it was a originally I was in grad school taking a computer engineering class and my project was I'm going to build a uh, on a very fancy Tektronics color display thousand pixel resolution thing. I built a game which was running through a maze trying to find a gold bar as a student project. And I figured out how to randomly generate terrain. Mm -hmm. how they randomly generate the layout of the maze. It's such a simple algorithm, but it, now you look at, there's a the game out now on the consoles, uh, I think, which is basically a science fiction game, and the entire planet is algorithmically generated. The entire thing is algorithmically generated. It's freaking amazing. The wow. creatures, everything. It's come so far. It's so cool. <laughs> In a way, 
we've had discussions about this in the game industry a lot. Mm -hmm. Budgets are really very high. And you take a company like um, Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog did a game a couple just recently called The Last of Us. Have you heard of it? No, I have not. Uh, I will tell you personally, and you can quote me on this, the, the Last of Us is the finest game I've seen in 20 years. It is a yet another zombie game, mm -hmm. but what, what's, what the difference is they did such a fantastic job with the characters and the, uh, the gameplay and the story that it is better than anything Hollywood has ever done in terms of a story, and the game itself makes complete sense and is gorgeous to look at, incredible to play, and it all works. It is what everyone in interactive fiction wanted to do years ago, to create a game that was compelling drama in a game, and they did that. But when I talk to people about the game, I say, well, are they going to follow up with more games using the same system? The answer is not really easy for them to do because that game required hundreds and hundreds of people to build all that scenery and all those levels and all those objects. The expense there is in the actual creation of the assets for the game and and all of that all the uh media for the game mm -hmm. not so much in the game engine and i and and i go well you know the only way we're ever going to get out of that is to is to have a lot of the stuff like buildings streets forests mountains all that is going to have to be generated through algorithm and not by artistry i mean the artists will create textures the artists will will guide the algorithms but we can't you can't afford to do they're running into a brick wall on the uh, on the AAA game space right now because of the cost of building games. I think the the budget for the latest Grand Theft Auto was three hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and what's fun about the mobile space? The reason I went into mobile is obvious. All the guys and girls who had been in gaming in the '80s went into mobile in the early 2000s decade, literally because we were the only people who had remembered what it was like to build a small game. Right. When mobile first started, you had 64K phones, 64 kilobyte phones mm -hmm. with lousy displays. Yeah. I, I mean, literally like uh, one phone, the, the one the Nokia series, the series uh, 40, a very popular phone, was like 128 by 128 graphics, 64K of RAM. Mm -hmm. And a horrible programming system as well, just, just, just crap. Um, crap development systems, like worse than the Atari ever was. You could, you could do much more on a 48K Atari than you could ever do on a 64K Nokia phone. So, but those of us who had struggled with the, the Atari VCS, those guys, or people like me who had struggled with the TRC-80 and all that, we kind of knew how to build small games, so we flowed into that space in the 2000 decade. And even now, if you look at the iPhone in all its glory, there's still these small games that show up that do really well, like Flappy Bird, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and they it, it, it do well because in many ways the form factor is the form factor and people a lot of people don't want a, a detailed experience they just want to get in the game and get out of the game you know right I, I regret totally regret not taking controller when the uh, iPhone hit and doing controller because someone took did that and did a game called flight path where they took the simple type of air traffic control game we had done and they did it for the Apple for the iPhone. It was a big success. Is that the one where you just you tell it uh, the air, you kind of give it the exact path the airplane has to start here and go down to this? Um, yeah, you, you draw the lines. You draw the lines. You draw the lines, you draw, yeah, you draw the lines of where the airplane's supposed to right. go. Right. Yeah, I played a version of that for a while. Was it addicted to that for a while? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, um, yeah. So in many ways, the skill sets for the uh, games in the '70s and '80s are the skill sets for a lot of mobile games. And in fact. Our team is working on an iWatch. Uh, doing a, we're doing an Apple Watch game, and uh, and what's interesting is the it's a, it's going to be a casual casino card game. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's familiar and it makes sense. Right. But um, the people working on that game are people who did casual casino card games for those crappy phones in the uh, mm -hmm. 2000 decade. So even though the watch looks like it's a really tiny dis display and all that, it's exactly what we dealt with in 2003, 2004 on the phone. So there you go. Everything that's old is new again. <laughs> it's true. Yep. Tinier screens, bigger and tinier at the same time. Yeah. Things go in two different directions. You have yeah. AAA yeah. games running, you know, at, um, you know, super high def resolutions running at full frame rates with um, millions of polygons. And you take a look at like Assassin's Creed or anything like that. It's like, wow, this is, 
this is what we dreamed would happen, and it finally did. Right. At the same time, you have people basically, you go online at a bank, and people are playing the most simplest games possible on their phones just to pass the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the way it is. Pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, so PlayScreen will have a, a watch game when the uh, watch gets shipped. Nice. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. It'll be fun. So what haven't I asked you about the Atari days that I should have? I'm trying to think of what else. Um, oh, do you, you realize that the people who worked on the chipset for the Atari ended up working on the chipset for the Amiga? Sure. Jay yeah, Miner so that was crew. interesting because since I went into the Amiga in a big way, it was kind of a very nice sense of continuity to, to know those people like Jay Miner and all those guys. Mm -hmm. they, um, they obviously rocked really well. The Amiga was a, an amazing machine. Yes, it was. Yeah. And at Aegis, even though I was mostly involved in the drawing and the video, you know, and the uh, sort of um, graphic stuff, we did do a game with some Germans called Ports of Call, which is still out there. And Ports of Call and the Amiga, in many ways, was the model that eventually games like um, all these building games like Farmville and and even stuff like Clash of Clans, yeah. it sort of comes from that idea of a building game. Uh, Ports of Call in 1987 was sort of the, the one of the precursors to that sort of building game. An economic game where you build up a uh, 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 property and in this case ships and, and do things with the ships and stuff and stuff. It's pretty amazing. Nice. All good. If you could send a message to the Atari 8-bit community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Um, I would say that um, in many ways, the best of the Atari games are extremely good games because they had to be. You know, the Atari was a, uh, an advanced computer for its day, but we all had, you know, this memory limitation stuff. So we, we had to focus on gameplay really, really carefully. We, we couldn't just throw graphics at the problem. We had to do really good gameplay. So you take a look at a game like Eastern Front, uh, which I think is one of the finest Atari 800 games ever made. Mm -hmm. um, that thing is a masterpiece. I mean, it's you look at these things and they're like gems. So I would say that the, the, the best of the Atari 800 games are, in a way, a snapshot in history of where the video game industry was and where it was going to go in these highly crafted gems of games and now with the way the industry is particularly on mobile you have that again you have highly crafted gems of games and that look even that retro look is extremely popular uh on on the uh, phones now and it all really comes down to that error when we were basically forced to apply as much creativity as we could to a uh a constrained domain which was the actual device itself we couldn't go off and put megabytes of code into the game. Right. We couldn't go off and have have uh, cutscenes. You know, we couldn't do that. So we had to focus on the play, gameplay, 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 and that's what we did. And that's why this is interesting. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. So I gotta get back to my other call. Great. Uh, this Let was me... great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.